people forget to pray for others <clears throat> in direct proportion to the frequency with which they say, I'll pray about that. <laughs> right? Right. If I don't pray for something right then and there when somebody says something, I will forget. That is, that is not an if. That is a guaranteed. In any prayer group, at any given moment, 95% of the people will not be paying attention to your prayer. 55% will be daydreaming. 20% will be thinking about what they're going to say. 14% will be wishing you wouldn't blab so long. 5% will have their eyes open. And 1% will be wondering why you have your shirt inside out. Making sure my shirt's not inside out. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, 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 when I when I found those, it's it's a little book of funnies that I've I've got in my my office, and I was just kind of thumbing through them when I was writing this sermon, and, and I'm just seeing what they had on prayer, and I, I I read through that, and I'm like, gosh, I can find myself in any one of those at any given point, um, depending on where my day is at at that particular moment. Um, As much as we talk about prayer, and as much as we do pray, um, some of some of these these things that are, are are funny, honestly, do come and, and become. Some of them hold some truth to them. Um, you know, prayer is is a very important thing. We're going through this series. Um, going through this series right now called pray and last we talked last week we talked about protection and, and promise and this week we're going to hit the subjects of mercy repentance and and the subject of intercession um, which in our prayer time um, every Sunday morning that is that is more times than not a, a time of inter intercession when we are interceding on the behalf of other people we're going to start off in Psalm 51 today. I, I know I've, I've kind of, we've kind of covered this psalm before, um, but, but we're going to focus in on mercy and repentance first today. Psalm 51, let's kind of give a little backstory here. Psalm 51 is Psalm 51's a story, or the psalm that, that David wrote after he had had the affair with Bathsheba and the, the child that they had was sick and dying. Nathan had come to confront David and gave him this story of a man who, he didn't name David in it, but said, hey, this is, uh, um, there's a man who's done this. And David's like, man, the dude should be put to death. And Nathan goes, um, that's you. And David goes, oh, <laughs> oops, is just about right. <laughs> um, Psalm 51 is David's response. We're going to start in verse 1 here. Mercy and, and repentance... Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. The first thing David does here is he asks for grace, mercy, and forgiveness. You see, David is described in God's word as a man after God's own heart. Was David sinful? Absolutely he was sinful. He was not a perfect dude. But David also knows God. David knows that God is a loving God, ready to forgive those who are broken. You see, that's one of the keys to this, is that God is a gracious God towards those who are broken about their sin. If there is no brokenness about their sin, there is no loving God. 
that's part of it. That's, that's part of, of coming to faith in Christ. Is It's not just a walk up the aisle. This is, this is a being broken over your sin. This is actually the definition of repentance. We, we describe repentance as though it's this, this, this 180 degree behavior change. Actually, repentance is more along the lines of being broken over your sin than anything else. Hmm. Interesting. We see this um, in conjunction with verse 17, which we will, we will get to in a moment. Verse 17 reads like this. It says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. We'll get to verse 17 here in a, in a little, bit, little bit. Verses 2 and 3 go on. David says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. You see, he asks God to wash him and cleanse him. He confesses his sin here. He, he says, I know my transgression, my sin is ever before me. David is, is not coming to God in pride and rebellion, but he's coming to God in humility and repentance. He knows that his sin is great. Verse 4. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. The truth is, is that when we sin, it's solely against God and God alone. And, here's, and, and here is the tough part. God is justified to judge because of that. Because we are broken, because we are sinful and full of sin, God is absolutely justified to judge. Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Um. This speaks directly to the fact that we live in a broken and very sinful world. Joel Osteen is, is known for saying that most 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. That is a direct quote. As a matter of fact, I do believe the scriptures say that all have fallen short of the glory of God. I believe that is Romans 3.23, if I'm not mistaken. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We live in a sinful world. I was brought forth in iniquity, and, my mother, and in sin my mother conceived me. Well, he's the youngest of his siblings. His parents were married. It's not that he was conceived in sin as far as... as you know, uh, uh, oh, there's a word I'm looking for. It is escaping me right now. It, his, he, he wasn't conceived out of wedlock. That's what I'm looking for. It's just the fact that, that no matter who we are, we are born into sin. We are born sinful. We are, we are, there's no way around it. There is no way around the fact that, that we are absolutely unequivocally sinful. Verse 6. Behold, your desire, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know your wisdom. You see, God desires truth in here. This is the journey that I have described over and over. I knew it here. I didn't know it here. I knew it, but I didn't understand it. And, and this, this is what God desires. God desires this, this truth in our innermost being. In the very depths of who we are, God desires truth in, the, in there. 
He wants that truth. God knows how sinful you are. So tell him, repent, be broken over your sin. And it says, in the hidden part, you will make me know your wisdom. God is the one who illuminates his wisdom in this innermost being. It is impossible to do without do it without him. It is impossible. Because I can go through and teach things. But that's, that doesn't mean you're going to understand it. doesn't mean you're going to understand it. Verses 7 to 13. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach you transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. He says to cleanse. It is only God that can cleanse. He asks God to wash him, wash him whiter than snow. And, and, and he, he goes on to, he says that, that, that God make me here with God joy and gladness and, and, and the bones that are broken, let them rejoice. And, and, and he's asking God again to be gracious and merciful to him and turn his face away from his sins. And, and in this is verse 10, which to me, at least, as I read through this, 10 is kind of the, the hinge point. You know, a door swings open, it swings open on hinges. This, this is the hinge point on which this, the door of this psalm swings. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. This is repentance. Understanding that we are broken. We need a clean heart. We need a, 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 a steadfast spirit. He asks God not to cast him out of his presence, to continue to keep his Holy Spirit in him and, and restore the joy of salvation, sustain him. And then in 13 and 14, he will teach transgressors. And sinners will be converted. Verse 14 and 15 goes on, says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. Only God can save. Deliver me, Lord, David says. Then we will rejoice. Then we will sing of God's righteousness open our lips to praise you this is my gripe with songs in worship services it doesn't it's any worship service if the song is not declaring the greatness of god it should not be played in worship because it is it, every song that we sing should be declaring the righteousness of God, the greatness of God, the glory of God. It, it, is, it is not, here's the famous phrase, it's not about us. Too many of the modern songs today focus on me. It's not about you. This is not about you. This is about the greatness of God and what he's done. That's why we should be singing praise and worship in our worship services. O 
open our lips to praise you. Verse 16. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. In the New Testament, Jesus says, go and learn what this means. That I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Killing a, a, a goat or a ram or a bull or a lamb means nothing if there is not a broken heart, a broken innermost being to go with it. It means absolutely nothing. God doesn't delight in sacrifice, so what is he looking for? Here is verse 17 that we touched on earlier. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God will not despise a person who comes to the altar absolutely, unequivocally broken. This is why David, David was not rejected by God in this sin with Bathsheba. Because when Nathan came and confronted him, he was absolutely broken, even so to the point that he knew God was so gracious that he even pleaded on behalf of the child who was dying. Because who knows, God may relent. When the child finally did pass, David got up, washed himself, cleaned himself up, got something to eat. And everybody was like, what are you doing? And David explains it. He's like, God didn't answer my prayer. It's okay. I will see the child again. Life goes on, in other words. Life goes on. Mourn over your sin. Be broken. Let your spirit be crushed. You can offer a sacrifice all day long and still miss the point. Are you, or, are you or have you ever been broken over your sin? This is repentance defined. It is repentance defined. It is being broken over your sin. And when you are broken over your sin, you are going to go, number one, to the God of the universe who can resolve that and did so through the blood of Christ. But going to God in humility and being broken before him. From personal experience. Is life changing. It is life changing. We've made repentance out to be something that we do. Correcting our behavior. Doing this. Doing that. R repentance is more being broken over your sin than it is anything else. Not that a change doesn't come with it, but repentance is more, more of an attitude than it is anything else. He finishes out Psalm 51 with 18 and 19. He says, by your favor, do good, in, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar protect us in other words and god will delight in the sacrifices in the old testament it was the blood of bulls and goats and rams and lambs in the new testament it is it, our spiritual act of worship uh, romans 12 1 let me flip there Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the sacrifice today. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Now, intercession. Let's go to Exodus. 
Exodus 32, 10 to 18. This is a very interesting. You see, in chapter 32, Moses has already gone up Mount Sinai, and he's been up there a while. God has given him the Ten Commandments. He's giving him other instructions, other laws. And at the end, (laughs) in verse 7 of chapter 32, God says this to Moses. He says, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is O your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. God's not very happy. (laughs) He's like, man, this is a stubborn people. Man, what is God? Like, seriously. (laughs) Moses then comes and intercedes. Watch this. Verse 11. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptian speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens in all of this land of which I have spoken. I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit forever. Moses goes through and then intercedes on behalf of Israel to God. He's like, you know what? He reminds God of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And and he's like, should the Egyptians say that, that, wow, look at this. Their God brought them out there to kill them. (laughs) Yeah, no. Um, Moses is like, God, I don't know that this is really, uh, is this really what you want? The funny part is, is that after Moses intercedes, verse 14 says, so the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets which were written on the sides, and they were written on one side and on the other, and the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. And what does Moses proceed to do? Take the tablets of God's testimony and smash them to smithereens because he got mad about the same thing that God just did. A lot of people look at this scripture and say, well, well, God really wasn't going to destroy Israel. He was just testing Moses. No. No. God was going to obliterate them. <laughs> I have no doubt. Because even, even if God creates a nation out of Moses, it is still, the promise is still fulfilled to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Moses, he's a descendant of them. But Moses Moses pleaded on behalf of Israel. Most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, when we find intercession going on in the Bible, it is asking God to relent from judging a people. So, therefore, the subject that we talked about in Sunday school this morning about how the thing that is not preached from the pulpit is God's judgment, um, 
that's very accurate because they don't like passages like this because it shows that God judges. And we don't like that. We like a nice fluffy God who is all rainbows and sunshine and happiness and love. And, and we don't like to hear about a God that judges. But here's the thing. Our God is a God that will bring swift judgment. And God does bring these things in judgment to create, you ready? Mercy and, and or create repentance in people. That's why I paired these two together. Because one feeds the other. Because God does judge. We intercede on behalf, and God does bring these things for the whole purpose of creating a repentance. And it works. And it works. You see, Genesis 18, 17 to 33 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham intercedes on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, surely, Lord, if there's 50 righteous people, you wouldn't destroy these people, would you? No, if there's 50 righteous people. Abraham negotiates with God. God, what boldness to suppose that you can negotiate with God. He negotiates them all the way down until we're talking to 10 people. If there are 10 righteous people, will you judge them? He's like, no, I won't judge them. May even get down to five if I'm not rem if I'm if I'm remembering right. Either way, that last number, there's not that many righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He, on as as a a, a loving kindness to Abraham, he sends the angels to remove Lot, his wife, and his two daughters out of there their future husbands are actually left behind because they refused to go with them. See, Abraham was interceding. And in this instance, judgment did come. James 5.14. We intercede like this. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That is intercession. We intercede on behalf of sick people. Psalm 35, 13, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, and I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. We, we intercede for the sick. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. We can intercede for a town, a community, or a nation. Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We can pray for those who are our enemies and those who persecute us. Jeremiah 14, 11. This one's an interesting one. You ready for this one? So the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Ooh. <laughs> Do not pray for them out of the word of God himself. It says not to pray for these people. Whoa. I guess there's a point that gets reached that God says enough is enough. It's not that they're not saved. They're still his people. Leviticus 26, God is faithful, but they sure aren't having an easy time of it. They are really struggling. They're having hard times, and hard times work to produce repentance. It's where we're at in our country now. We've got some hard times that we haven't seen in a while. And I would say we're long overdue. 
You see, God will not hear the prayer of the prideful because this isn't about sacrifices. It's not about pride. It's not about your works. But it's about a broken heart, crushed spirits. It is about faith and humility. The big idea today is important to mourn and be broken over your sin. Also, intercede for the sick, intercede for your community, intercede for your country, persecutors, for those who stand against God. It's why I pray um, every so often um, that we, you know, I, I pray for our community, and then I pray um, for spiritual victory. I pray for um, the chains of the broken, or the chains of the, the bound to be broken, and I pray for spiritual revival. Um, you know, I was talking about how we're in hard times. I mean, gas has shot, gas and diesel have shot way up. The price of food is way up. We have a crop and a, uh, we have a drought this year that is going to create further sh- food shortages because a lot of the crop didn't come because we didn't get rain. You want to tell me, tell me, argue with me, prove me wrong that this is not a judgment from God. Make the case. I'm willing to listen to you. But I'm telling you, I do not think any of this is an accident. This nation is under the thumb of judgment of God. And we had ought, we had ought to be brokenhearted and repent. The problem is, is that we think we're too smart. We think we can continue to kick the can down the road. Hard times produce repentance. One of the things, let, let, me, let me kind of finish out with a little encouragement here. One of the, I know, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to leave it off on that note. It is the truth. But let me, let me give a little encouragement here. Because the conversations I have had with out of the five kids who were um, from my college camp teams last week, two of them are declared preaching majors. There is a third kid who is going to be a preacher, but he just doesn't know it yet. He, <laughs> been there, done that. That was me. Um, I am encouraged by the conversations that I have had with these three kids. They get it. They understand it. They, are, they, they, they see the broken problems within mainstream Christianity and, and, and they, are, they are adamant, adamant about getting this right. I have I, I offered all three of them. Call me. I will work with you. I will do whatever I can to set you up with mentors and people. That's because that's what Jeremiah ten twelve was about. This is a network of pastors to help to help mentor pulpit ministers. <laughs> it's what we do. And I said I will I will do what I can to help help you in this. I am encouraged by this young generation coming out of some of the colleges, not all of them, but some of the colleges. Rest assured, God is producing a repentance. These things are coming. And I, am, I, I for one, am um, I'm very hopeful of what the future holds. We are, we are missing generations between y'all and, and the young folks in that generation. We're missing generation uh, generation there. But I'm encouraged by what this young generation is bringing. Because I think it is going to bring some good, good things to the church. And I'm excited for that. 